Welcome to the Shia for tonight. Matzah Shabbos, Ashes Shmois. The date on the uh, screen is inaccurate. Uh, it was written on Friday. So Friday was Chof Tevis, which was the yard site of the Rambam. And we are between the yard site of the Rambam and of the Alter Rebbe and Chof Dal Tevis. Meanwhile, before we go into that, a the, the Shia tonight is dedicated by our regular Rabinchas Rabin and family in honor of the recent wedding of his grandson, Dov Menachem Mendel, and uh, Hannah Shana of Oskhamus and Nair Rosenblum, and wish them all lots of Nachas, Lairach Yom and Shalom Tevis. As I say, we are between the Yorzet of the Alter Rebbe and of the Rambam, I should have said the other order. Just this morning I gave over a sicha in Chelek Chof Vov, where the Rebbe talks about the similarities between the Rambam and the Alter Rebbe in style and in lifestyle, in, 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 in the personal experience. One thing which I found interesting is that we know that the Rambam is a safer hakoilul, which is including uh, the entire Torah Shabal Pele Halocha, and the Rebbe uses a similar idea about the Tanya that it's a safer which is incorporated the it's a Torah Shabal of Chsidus, not only of Chsidus Chabad but of entire Chsidus. The whole it's it, it's condensed the whole the whole picture of I guess of of the Torah Hanefesh. Is included in the Tanya, so it's also like a Sefer Hakolol in this way, uh, similar to what the Rambam did. Okay, we'll go into our Shilas, which, some, which came through this week. So then, this week, a Bocher, or last week, a Bocher asks me there is this idea that if you are davening and you're a little bit late, you're davening with you're a little bit late, and you are Davening your quiet Shmon Esra whilst the Chazin is saying the loud Shmon Esra. So then there is permission for you to to parallel the Chazin, as in to be a tandem Chazin. And when it comes to Kedusha, when the Chazin says Nakdishoch and Kodesh, etc., you could say everything along with the Chazin. So this is a well known in Yen. Al Terebi in Shukhanoch is a little bit apprehensive about it, but that's not our discussion. We discussed it before, so I don't want to go into that to just to go over again and again. Here his question was, what happens if the Chazan is up for Musaf and I am at Shachris? So now, is it compatible that I should be a tandem Chazan when I am actually doing Shachris and the Chazan is doing Musaf? So this is actually addressed clearly in Shukhan Aruch, Simen Kuftes, where this general concept is discussed. And at first there was even a Svora is asking, what about if the Chazin is on for Kedusha Nivolotzian? Can you join along that? He negates. Yesh mi she'oyme. She'hu hadin mohoya atzibur oyme Kedusha Smusr. Vayochim is pal shel shacharis eino oyme mohoyim kodesh, eino Kedusha Shavos. There is an opinion which says, no, you can't do join in Musaf whilst you are in Shachris. It's a different type of Kedusha. The two Kedusha of Shachris and of Musaf are the same Kedusha, and therefore you can say, you can say um, Kedusha in your Shachris from Nasra. Along with the Chazan who's doing Musaf Shmachazar. And yes, he's, you're going to, what will you say? Will you say Nagdisho Keser? So you'll say, you'll say Keser. It's not foolish on the altar of Shikhanaruch, but I did go back to the tour and the, the Prisha, the commentary on the tour, it seems to be quite clear. Something that goes back to Arashbo, that we, according to Nusachat and Nusach Svard, so the Chazan would be saying Keser, and the Yochid would also be saying Keser, even though it's in Shacharis. Of course, if it was a Nusach Ashkenaz, so then 
The question would be Naritzach Unakadesh. It would be the same ruling. Right. Let's move on to the next question. Someone asks me this week. He is in the middle of putting on tefillin. And he hears he, he, he hears the Kaddish. So between Shalyad and Shalrosh, we do you answer Kaddish? So we've gone through this also in the past. That in the Shukhan Aruch, the Alter Rebbe says that you should not answer Kaddish between Shalyad and Shalrosh because that's going to cause you to incur another bracha. Despite that, in the Siddur, the Alter Rebbe says you should answer Kaddish. The reason being that we are normally saying only one bracha on tefillin, that is lohoniach tefillin. We only say al mitzvah tefillin on the shalroish in the case of interruption, says the Alter Rebbe. Here you've heard Kaddish. So what's going to be your answer? You, 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 what will be for your answer? You'll have to say al mitzvah tefillin. Then is your fellach. The Ashkenazim are saying al mitzvah tefillin every day. So today, in order to be able to say Amish Rabba, so you'll answer Amish Rabba and you'll say, yeah, Amish Rabba. So it's the initiative of your That's the Alter Rebbe's Psalm. Okay, so now, bottom line is for someone who's davening, I mean, our Nusach and puts on only one brach normally, he would interrupt to answer Amish Rabba. So now he's asking, once I've already interrupted to answer Amish Rabba, do I already answer all the Yomans of the Kaddish? Because after all, what's the hesitation? not to cause a another bracha, but that extra bracha is going to come in in any case because of interrupted for your Yomai to answer the other omens. So actually, this is not so posh. And what we're going to read now is that interrupting between Shilyad and Shalrosh is not only because of incurring, causing another bracha, but there's another reason that you shouldn't interrupt between Shilyad and Shalrosh and therefore, the people who you may see sometimes, whilst they're putting on regular times, they keep on running a conversation. It is, it, it's an ignorance there because you shouldn't be interrupting even between Shalyad and Shalosh of Rabbeinu Tams. And we'll see that inside. I just wonder before I forget this, there is a, an excellent sefer called Hefzik Bitfila, written by a Lubavitching man called Rabbi of Lemberg. I have the early edition. He's come out in a second and an expanded edition. And his, obviously, the idea of interrupting with Tefillah, that's his, his topic. You're all familiar, I'm sure, with the table at the back of the Siddur. And it's got about 108 squares or something. I don't I didn't count. But it's all these squares, got the combinations of you know, whether you do interrupt, you don't interrupt. In... In um, Rabbi Lemberg's Sefer, he does a very simple table. And it's basically got nine squares. You've got three levels. Are you in a level like Sukkot de Zimra or Nalesa? Are you are in the level of something like Birchas Krishma? Are you in the level like Shemun Esra? Three levels where no interruption at all, most lenient and somewhere in between. Then he has, those are the three columns of where Mahmad Hamispal, where you're holding. Then he has three levels of how important is the thing which you want to now interrupt with. Is it what's called Dova Shebe Kedusha? Is it a Chiyuv to answer, even though it's not a Dova Shebe Kedusha? And then is it on the level of Minhag? So Dova Shebekdusha means something which would only be done with a minion. So Omen Yehishmerabo would be on the level of Dova Shebekdusha. Then we have the next level, Dvorim Shehem Choy. If you hear a brocha, you have to answer Omen. Then you have less than that, Dvorim Shehem Minik. For example, answering Baruch Hu Shemoi. That's on the level of Minhag. So these are the three levels of importance. So now with those Thoughts in mind, let's now come read Al Rebbe's Shechon Aruch about interrupting between Shalyad and Shalrosh. As you can see, it's Simon, it's Sif Chof Beis, and that's in Simon Chof Hei of the Alter Rebbe, the first Simon in Hilchas Tefillin.
also la hafsik bein tfilin shel yad le tfilin shel rosh, afilu b'mokrim she'ein goyrim levorech shtei boch roches al tfilin shel rosh, even if it's not in causing you to have to say extra brachas on the shel rosh. When he says two brachas, that's going to Ashkenaz, but also but one bracha. For those who put on tefillin chalamayit without a bracha. One should not interrupt between the shalyad and shalrosh with chatting. And where does this come from? Posuk shenemar v'hoya lecho leois al yodcho ule zikorin beinenecha. It shall be as a sign on your hand and a remembrance between your eyes. It doesn't say they shall be, it shall be. Elo mashma, although there's two tefillin. Elo mashma sheshteim nechshovim lahavio vasiya achas. That the two tefillin are considered as a single entity, as a single doon, a single deed. Machmas shetzorich latoik von zoyach and zoy belishum hefsek because they should be in immediate, con- um, how do you say, sequence, one after the other without an interruption. This point is not written in the Gemara. The source of this is the Baal HaMoyer, the commentary on the Rif by Reb Zrach Yehalevi. So, in addition to where you have in the Gemara Soita, which talks about if a person interrupts between Shalyad and Shalrosh, it's Averi Biyodoi, and it would be considered an Averi that he should have to go back from the front line of the army because of the uh, so that's written in the Gemara but in addition to that of uh, in the causing of we have here that from the word you we learn that they should be and Shalrosh would be should be an immediate sequence one after the other having said that there is imp- that the one should not interrupt between Shalyad and Shalrosh yet there is room for leniency where now this is insignificant. Kadish and Borhu are the level of uh, which require a minion. Omen al kol is not a dova shibekdusha, it's dova shalchoiva. So even middle level of importance of Dvarim shel choiva says he have to answer. You would interrupt between shalyad and shalrosh, as he says in Rabbeinu Tam Ochel Amoyed. Since you're not making a bracha, so then you would interrupt for dvarim shel choiva. So now coming back to the kaddish, you've answered Omen Yishmerabo. What other parts of kaddish should you answer? Possibly only the possibly only damiram biyom, which is also dvarim shebikdusha. The rest of Kaddish, after, you know, um, Heishlomo, etc., would probably come under the level of Minhag, not on the level of Chayva, and therefore one should not interrupt. The only thing you can ask me, what, what about um, Shemir Kutshebrichu? Um, I'm inclined to say that's also called Zvarim Mishel Minhag, not a Chayva, and therefore in the Kaddish should only answer um, the two Omens of Omen Shemir Abo and Abdamir on Olmo. But if you hear another bracha between your Shalyad and Shalrosh, and it's a, it's a, so then you would answer the, the, the Amen to that bracha. Okay. So we, uh, someone's asking, Rabbeinu Tam, can, one can interrupt. So again, we're talking about Rabbeinu Tams, and we're saying that you can interrupt to answer Dvorim Shebekdusha and Dvorim Shebehen Choiva. But you should not interrupt for Dvorim, which are level of Minhag. So if you're in the middle of putting Rabbeinu Tams, and you hear someone say a bracha, you won't say Baruch Hu Shemoi, because that's Minhag. But you will say Omen, because that's Chayva. I hope that's clear. Let's move on. So here, someone asked me about this point. Is it okay in middle of putting on Tefillin, between Shalyad and Shalrosh, to walk from one place to the other. Sometimes, for whatever reason, 
let's say there's the mirror on the wall and shul and you take your shalrosh with you to, to uh, put it in front of the mirror to get it right so th what we have here the only source that you could find is actually this is from the munkacher of the, of the minchas alozar he has a sefer called nimuko erachaim so let's read this view through what he says where it says in simon chofei not to interrupt between shalyad and shalrosh bedibur he says love dafka bedibur or not only bedibur but even walking from your place and walking dal Amas distance is also called a hefsu. And he gives a reference to several places, Simukuf Einches and Simunches and etc. Simukhadoshin Hichas Shita, about the Brach on Shita. Going from one place to sometimes we have the concept of Shinui Mokoi. Going from one place to the other constitutes a hefsu. In the Shechita, actually, the, the Shechitim do not stay shtum for hours on end when they're shechting chickens. They do interrupt with other stuff. I believe they go even with the but they say one brocha for, for the Shechita for the day, I believe. The Haver Avede, the Choyzer, Oleh, Me'ercha, Mochome, the, the Munkache is inclined to say that interrupting with Shiryad and Shalrosh is stricter than the case over there with Shita, as we mentioned about here, but from the Gemara there. Um, then he says, if you did walk between Shalyad and Shalrosh, then you do not have to make another bracha. You don't have to repeat the bracha. So he's saying, you should not walk in between Shalyad and Shalrosh. It is very easy to say because I see some Tamidi Chachomim Sheher Gonasa Teva Etzlam Beyosim Bale Machshavos. I guess he what he means to say is people who are they tend to walk around with their thoughts and they get carried away. And when he says when they're finished wrapping the, around their arm, they'll take the Tvil Shalrosh and they're walking around whilst they're putting on the Shalrosh, etc. And until they tighten it and they're ready to walk Dal Damas, he sees this as a hefsuk. And there he says, Yizaru shaloyleilech, don't walk around. Ragbim koimon yanichu tfilon shalroish kenizka. So he says, as a hearer, actually, now that I've finished reading what he says, I don't remember where he, where you see this, that elsewhere in Halacha, that walking dal damas counts as a hefzik. I, mean, I was trying to remember somewhere. Um, we have that sometimes, like after, ne before Negelbas, they shouldn't walk dal damas. You have in the context of of Tchum Shabbos, and there on the contrary, you say that within a house, it's considered all like one Dal Damas. So I'm not sure how strong you know his, his sources are, but fine. The Chachila, there's no loss in staying in one place. <clears throat> Someone is pointing out a val valuable point, and that is, if you are putting on your Tfilin, and the Chazin, or someone is saying Kaddish, and I just said, according to the Alter Rebbe in Siddur, you're going to have to interrupt to say Amen Shmirabo. So if you have just done, if you've already tightened your Shal Rigad on the arm, you can stop there and put on your Shal Rosh immediately. And then perhaps you will be able to avoid having to interrupt between Shal Rigad and Rosh and answer Amen Shmirabo without incurring another bracha. That's thank you for that. Or that's true. Yes. Let's move on. So here is an interesting question that, interesting how we're all filling questions for the moment, or the last, this is the third of the twilling questions for, for today. And this is a shliach somewhere, I don't know where, somewhere I think in the United States, and with email could be anywhere, right? So then he uh, asks like this, he wants to chap Yidin in his town. And one way of getting hold of, in contact with Yidin is that going to the, to the uh what they call in English the grounds going to the Bisalem and when there's a Leviah so then you have relatives who come relatives friends and there are there's time there's, there's usually a bit of spare time to pull over someone uh, to a distance from the uh grave from the graves from any graves not only the, the fresh one and to put on to fill them with them over there See, so to put on tefillin with them outside the base island looks like he says that's less likely he'll get them. But inside, he's, he's, uh, 
he finds it's, it's more 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 practical. So actually, in England, they have this uh, style in the United Synagogue, at least they have like the chapel or they, uh, where they have where, where they see the Kadin is done. And then, although that's within the complex of the of the uh, cemetery, but it's quite a distance from from the Kvarim. That would be more in, in interesting, more, you know, more acceptable. But here he's talking, I think it sounds like he's talking just out in the field. So here we have a din shukhanaruch and simon memhei in Oyachayim. So the top is from the shukhanaruch and the bottom is from the Alter Rebbe's shukhanaruch. So the shukhanaruch writes, Osu li kones beves hakvoris, one is, may not enter a cemetery, oi besuch arba amis shel meis. Nor may one, um, or nor within four armors, four cubits of a dead person, or tefillin bereshe, and whilst you're wearing tefillin on your head, it's as if you are scoffing at the poor, namely that the deceased is unable to do this mitzvah, and so you are mocking them, but you're doing a mitzvah, they cannot do the mitzvah. If the tefillin are covered, that is permitted. <clears throat> the Taz, the commentary on the Shulchan Aruch, raises the point that actually in the Gemara it only talks about within Dalad Amis of a, of a, a caver or of a mace. It doesn't talk about not entering the cemetery altogether. Then he says it seems to be a precaution not to go into the cemetery so as not to, by mistake, go close to a, a grave. So that explains how the Alter Rebbe presents the halacha. You see care how it is. He's changed the order, and he says, "Also, the corners betoch dal dal mitzvah meis, or shall kever." One's not allowed to enter within the four cubits of a deceased or of a grave. Tefillin bereishe mishum leig l'rosh, because you're scoffing at the the poor. Or base hakvores shomukev mechitza. If you have a cemetery which has a wall around it, so till now we're talking about a, a, an odd, a, a, a single grave, etc. What about if it's a cemetery? You shouldn't enter the cemetery altogether. I feel a rochic harbim in Akavaris, even far away from any graves. Shemo yiskarev beter dal the amis shel eze kaver. You might get close to uh, within four cubits of a grave. Believe me, believe us without realizing. Then he goes on. He says outside the mechitzo, you're allowed to even within dal the amis. Because the wall would inter inter interrupt. Okay. So Lechayre, it seems to be that he's not allowed to put on to fill in with the people there. Now, now, a couple of points here. Number one is the Moshal, you have the all same thing about not having, not having your tzitzis out when near a grave. Is there a difference between a grave of a man or a woman? Because a woman doesn't wear tzitzis in her lifetime in any case. She's close to Hashem without a tzitzis. So therefore, is it like the Rosh? She says, I don't need your tits. So the Prima God seems to say that it that doesn't apply. Like the Rosh doesn't apply to someone who doesn't have that mitzvah. I'm wondering, now this I'm just just more on a, on a uh, how do you say, on a hergish approach. You've got this person, perhaps many of the graves there, who did not put on tefillin regularly. Is there loyeg Rosh that you put on tefillin near them? Is it possible the other way around that actually you're doing a nachas for the neshama, for the nifter, by the fact that through their, through their, you know, if in Mahalavaya, the Rayidin who don't normally put on tefillin or never put on tefillin, and you're, they are the, the goyer and they're the cause was to put on tefillin. So that's on a, on a hergish level. But I want to look at one other point. It's sent to Diuk. It says, you shouldn't enter Beisach for us without wearing your tefillin. So that, I, I, I think that is the following. You have a man who's wearing tefillin the whole day, or you know, hours on end, and he's going to walk around, and he's going to walk into the Beisach, and he's not going to be careful. He may inadvertently walk close to a grave. We're not talking about entering wearing tefillin. We're talking about at a distance from a cave to stop there to, to, to you know, bring someone over con consciously for um, away from any graves and put on to fill in there. So it's not Likonis, it's not what the Shukhanach says. It's something different. 
It's 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 to put on tefillin in a base like forest, but not likonis be base like forest. So you, there is room to say that the halach and shachanor doesn't apply. The idea that he's going to walk around, you're right there. You're going to it's, it's he's only putting it on for for the for the minute which you're putting on tefillin with him. So it's not explicitly included in the in the, what's written in the shachanor. There's room for what we call wiggle room. Yes, the Alter Rebbe uses the terms yesh lahachmir, and is it lahachmir? Is in this case, Ayuda hasn't put on tefillin perhaps in years. Is it a, is it is it a good is it a chumra not to put on tefillin with him? Perhaps the other way around. So I think there is room to allow to put on tefillin in the base oilam far away, more than dal damas from any kvarim, and you know it's, it's, it hasn't been clearly forbidden in the shulchan aruch. So yes, lahokel I believe. Let's move on. So here's the question. We um, we need to have, in order to say Kaddish, etc., we need to have 10 adult men within a room. What is the story if there is a portable Mechitza and one man decides for whatever his Meshagasen, could be very legitimate reasons, but he's behind the Mechitza. It's in the room, but he's behind the Mechitza. Is he part of the minion or not? So here we have, this is from Simon, um, Simon Nunhe. That's where you have the topic of of um, of the whole, whole idea of a minion. And so the Mr. Brewer is quoted here. When you have nine people in one place and one is behind a curtain, which is poison lit sneers, so it's starfin, just to so to clarify. Elsewhere, and we've gone through this several times. If someone is another in another room, we discussed also about when you've got like a through lounge and two separate rooms. Are they mitzarev to a minion? There we had a whole business of he shows his face, etc. Here we're talking about in one room, but Navos in the room there is a, a screen. So you see later he talks about uh, you have let's say you've got a big pillar. And a man is standing behind the pillar. We have this. It's uh, in the shul upstairs in Lubavitch. So we have this huge monolithic um, Aaron Kodesh and uh, Omid and uh, a bookcase. And it kind of, there can be someone standing behind it. And most of the people in the shul won't be able to see them. It's all in the same room. And the halacha is that they are going to make up your minion. And of course, it's, it is vexing for those who say, where's the minion well there's one guy behind and we don't have a, a mirror in the corner to be able to see who's hiding behind well, perhaps an idea um but meanwhile yes if they are in the same min in the same room and the mechitz is only there for it's for for years for for privacy if I, then then let them start if it would be a mechitz for different reasons sometimes you have a mechitz which is to create a separate halachic entity that would be a different story. So when I was, I went through this with someone earlier in the week, last week. So there's a whole discussion about a woman benching Gaimo after giving birth. So in Chabad, it's uh, not well, not known that, that it's done. There's someone called Rebaral Alenik. Uh, perhaps his ankle is, on, is online here with us. Um, that when his wife gave birth, the first uh, first child, he told the Rebbe that she came to the Cheder Sheni in 770 and she said, Bechasagoimu. So the Rebbe said to him, To the Bochim Mam Gezok Shechiano. It was like well, it's a novelty. It's the first time they hear such a thing. So in Chabad, it's not so well known, even though the Alter Rebbe does say that a woman does, but the Poyal, it's not done. Yeah. Now, but some some circles they do and then the question is could the woman stand in the Erzas Noshim and say and because it does say in the, in the Pasuk um, um, the Lashem of the Pasuk in Tilim Kov Zayin should be within within an Eidor you have to have to have 10 people so is she present in the Eidor when she's standing in the behind the 
behind the mechitza. It probably very much depends on the structure of the mechitza, etc. But listen, no one asked me this question, so we're going to go into the next one. Okay. So now, here's the following. Going back to what we discussed earlier about being a tandem chazan. So, all right, you're running a bit late, and it's Shabbos, and you join the chazan for Chazor Sashatz. And so then the chazan came to Machai Mesim, and you said together, Nakrishach with the chazan, until it came, Yimlai Hashem Lakai Chzi and Adavid Haluko, and it was a very nice singing during Kedusha. By the time it came to Atta Kodosh, you forgot that you're davening your own Shmonestra. You just listened to the chazan, and then you, after Akela Kodesh, you sat down like everyone else. And then a minute later, you're, oops, I'm in the middle of Shmonestra. What happened? I meant to, um, yeah. Now, here's the difference. The, the, the question which was put to me this week was, and perhaps we discussed this also, when do you, if you want to mention or for a for Shlema or any other request, so in many Sidurim, if you want to mention a particular name, it has in Refoenu, it has how to include the mention of a specific person's name for asking Hashem for a for Shlema. There is a letter of the Rebbe where he says instead of saying it in Refoenu, it should be said in Shema Kileinu. So this this gentleman apparently, till recently, he'd been when he did this mentioning various uh, people for for uh, refuah, refu, he was in doing it at the Kainitzer. And then he learned they should do it in Shmakeleno. Okay, so Shmakeleno, he says his, his whole list of whoever he wants to ask for a Fuah Shlemo. And then he does Oisha Shalom because he was so used to that. He's, he's, uh, he's you know, right after this list, he's, he's finished his davening. So this is basically the question. If you are in the middle of Shmonasra and you interrupt it, do you, what do you do now? So here we're going to look at the Ride Halokha carefully. So we have now, this is in, as you can see, it's in Simen Kuf Dalet, Siv Dalet. Bechol Mokin She Poisek. If you do interrupt in the middle of Shemun Esra, so then if it was beyond your control, if the delay was so, so long that you could have finished the whole Shemun Esra, let's say there was some something, a noise or a smell or something which caused you to have to stop your davening, if you stop so long that you could have finished the entire Shemun Esra, well, then you're going to have to go back to the beginning, start all over again. The second paragraph. If there was a short delay, so then, then we go back to the beginning of the Brocha in which you interrupted. If it was in the middle of Baruch Aleinu or Shmach Aleinu, so then you'd go back to the beginning of that Baruch. If this interruption was in the first three Baruchas, then you get the beginning of the Baruch, because the first three Baruchas are considered as one unit. If this is the last three Baruchas, then you go to the Ritzei, because the last three are considered one unit. Then he goes on, but this is all when it was Bachmas Oynus Beshoigig, Avol. Okay, so this is what we. Uh, yeah, but if you know, then that's all right. Again, uh, if some, I guess I skipped to a couple of lines. And he says, even if you were Mafsig Bedibur, Oynus, Shoigig, Beemsa Eze Brocha, if you did not go back to the beginning of the Brocha, but you just continued and you finished your davening, then you have to go back to the beginning of davening. Let's let's um, let's summarize what happens over here. What we've seen here is someone in middle of davening took a break, so he has to go back to the beginning of that bracha. So if it was Shema Kileinu, he'd go back to and when the, the second case which I described, he would go back to the beginning of the bracha Shema Kileinu. If it was the first case which I described. That he before Hokela, before Atta Kodesh, he sat down and I guess, well, what did he interrupt with? But if, if he did interrupt with something, then he wants to resume and have to go back to the beginning of Shema Nasra. Now, what would happen if by Shema Kaleinu, 
He rose up from almost sitting down for he got up and he continued where he left off. But he had meanwhile interrupted. But I'm here we talk about more interrupted Bedibur, although what we're talking about is by sitting down. If he interrupted Bedibur. So then what's the halacha? Let's go back. He says like this. If you did not correct the mistake by going back to the beginning of the bracha, you just continued where you left off. Then you're going to have to go back to the beginning of Shemun Esra. Why is that? Let's say you were in the middle of Refa'enu and you were interrupted or you interrupted. And instead of going back to the beginning of the bracha, you continued where you left off. Then that bracha does not count because it was in, an interrupted bracha. You can't, and therefore, when you've done your Shemun Esra, Actually, there's one bracha which is missing. You can't make up for the brachas shaloy ala seder. You can't put in a refoenu after shemei atfila, for example, because the brachas have to go at afka ala seder. So if you kind of spoiled one of your brachas because of that interruption, and you didn't correct it by going back to the beginning of the bracha, you just continued. Then you'd have to then then uh, then you'd have to go back to the beginning of Shmuel Nestor. So Bikitsa, that's the answer that this person who this this um, stopped short in the middle of Shmuel Nestor, the Chayre, um, especially if it didn't realize right away, if it realized after a little pause, so then that would invalidate the the Shmuel Nestor, the Hemshech. He'd have to go back to the beginning. I think that's. That, that should be the rule of thumb over here. I'm, I'm hesitating because it wasn't a hafsik bedibur, it was just a hafsik by sitting down. But again, if it was a long hafsik till he realized, what did I do? Then for sure it would be justified to go back to the beginning of Shmoy Nasra. Let's move on to our next question. Right, so this is actually a feedback on what we discussed a couple of weeks ago. Why is it so let's let's just retrace what happened over here. And the question is like this: um, in the Sefer Hamin Hogim, it brings down about the amounts of time for in in, in, in or, or if you're eating on a fast day, if you're if you're eating for a person who's not well, how much how much time? Two, three minutes, four minutes, five minutes. Which means you eat small amounts with intervals. Now, what my question was that this is known in Hilchas Shem Kippur, but generally the halacha is that other fasts, if a person is not able to fast, we tell them just to eat normally. So why, why is this mentioned? So I traced this and showed how this was said by the Tzemach Tzedek in relation to a uh, epidemic at his time, and I suggested. Why does he mention of, of having small amounts and not just say, if you're not well, eat and finish? So I suggested that it may be because it was the entire community. That's why he was uh, saying have small amounts. And I mentioned last week that someone else suggested, a bit of I had mentioned a different explanation, that because the people who were telling to eat, perhaps they, are, they aren't ill. It's only we want to tell them that they shouldn't reduce their immunity and therefore they should eat, but they're not ill. No, so I, I so someone said to me that this discussion comes up in the Mishnah Bura, and what I want to share with you is just an interesting twist what happened over here. So this is in the Mishnah Bura. As we know, the Mishnah Bura has got also a margin which called Bir Halocha, which is like more in, in, in intricate stuff. This is in Tokkut Nundala, the dinim of the other fasts, the other, you know, like a Tishabov or... Um, etc. Now, the Mishabur quotes the Pischei Olam very many times. I'm going to tell you in a, who the Pischei Olam is. This was a Chabad Chosid by the name of Reb Dovbre Karalevich, the Reb Dovbre Karasik. He lived in a town called Karalevich, and it's a whole story what motivated him um, to, to compile this. It's like a a, 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 a liquid, a digest around the Shukhan, on the Shukhan Orch Erechaim. Rabdov Be'er Karasik, his son in law, 
was Rav Medalia, who became the Rav of Moscow, and his son was Rabbi Hillel Medalia, who was the Rav of Leeds for many years and subsequently became of the Rav of the Shemer Hadass community in Antwerp. And I, when I, I, I met him several times as a child, he came to London and uh, Rabbi El Chaikin was our teacher, and he brought Rav Medalia to test us, and he did it with sort of the trick of putting, you know, a, pre, a pin through the Gemara and telling you which word it's going to go through on page on this and this page. That's the kind of uh, shtick he could do. A brilliant man. And uh, so coming back to the Pisri Yolam. So he's uh, this Rebbe Karelovitz, the Rebbe Karasik. So in his Sefer Pisri Yolam, he writes, the Bemokrim, where there is the, the cholera, the cholera, if it's not so strong, chas v'sholem, then to eat less than the size of a fig, within with you know within the time frames within the window of the Tchadechilas Pras, and also have interruptions as far as drinking small amounts with interruptions, as we have in Tofresh Yudches, which is in Hilchas Yom Kippur, Kain Yesh Lohoyrois Lishoyel Betishabov. This is how you should advise. Someone asks in relation to Tishabov, Sheboze Loineka Hatan is Legamri. In this way, the tiniest is not cancelled totally. Boy. And one who wants to fast where the where the um, um, epidemic is not Bazam Khasashol, not so fierce, then we, he's advised not to go out of his house a whole day. He should stay. Um, and if he does have to go out, he should wear something around his face, a, a cloth over his face, a camphor, uh, and, and a bit of miata, some kind of mint under the cloth around his face. So this is the Bir Halocha quoting the Pischayoylam. On the lower right, you have here the Pischayoylam, where he's quoting this from. And you can see here lower down that. Where does it come from? Tshuva's Divo in Nechemia, Ayrachayim Mem Aleph, B'Shem Atmur, and B'Shem Mem Beis, Polig Al Zeh Ayn Shom. And later, the, the um, Divo in Nechemia, who was a colleague of the Tzemach Tzedek, he's arguing on this point. But the, this, this, in other words, this quote in the Mishnah Bura is actually the Loshen of Tzemach Tzedek. In case you're not so sure, here is you have on the screen, the tshuva of the tzemach tzedek. This is from the Divrei Nechemia. Tshuva sat mor hagon hakodesh maramam. That's the the tzemach tzedek. To the hagon hamchab to Rebbe Nechemia Devarafi. And here he writes: the afal pikein, the mokim hamachla bechosko, sheinu machem bechosko have a pochos mikakuisets. What happened over here? And just to explain, and I, I did spend time this this evening looking over. The Divri Nechemi. Here was the question, very much like a bit of ice was saying. The, the Reb Nechemi of Dubrovna is writing to Tzemach Tzedek. If the people were ill, Shalom, then we tell them to eat normally. But here they're not ill. You're only worried that if they fast, they might become ill. So that doesn't fall into the heter that a choyla doesn't need to fast. It's a little bit less than that. It's, it's more preventive rather than reacting to a current situation. This is a, Nehemia has a whole long discussion about this. And on this, the Tzimach Tzedek is answering. I accept. Divrei, he says, Vadai divrei katar Certainly your words are very convincing. That, that I don't have a clear hat for people not to fast at all. Nevertheless, I'm advising that they should have pochas and mikakoy sabbas. It's not, uh, he's, it's, it's the other way around. He's not saying if they want to eat, they should only have a kosevas. He's saying the other way around. I'm telling people, don't compromise your immunity. And although you're healthy, and although I don't have a clear hatter for you not to fast, I'm telling you, all right, so have, but you should eat less than a kosevas at intervals. So, and in this way, you, and that's what he says here, the Loshin, um, really, I've, I've, I've told you perhaps that you shouldn't fast altogether. All right, I'll concede that you'll fast by eating eating small amounts. 
That's what the Tzimach HaSedek is saying over here. So really very much what Rabbi Yudel was had, had said, that it's not talking about a choyle. So a choyle is clear that if a choyle on, on the other fast besides Yom Kippur, if they have to eat, they eat normally without any compromises. And um, what's being said here is if a person needs to eat so that they shouldn't become ill, that's where we have the idea of having smart, uh, eating at intervals as similar to Yom Kippur. So, therefore, th that's which is written the way it's in in in, in uh, Sefer Menhagim may be a little bit misleading because you get the impression that by other fasts also we talk about having less than a shear. Well, that's not that's not the case. If a person is ill, we tell them to eat normally. If a person isn't ill, they're all right. Sometimes people aren't ill; they just want to have something for preventive. All right, then we'd say have have uh, small amounts of intervals. Yes, right. Now let's go back to another discussion and I had a lot of a, a bit of feedback on this going back to the uh, having having um, sponge cake being served as dessert and we had this discussion whether you make a bracha or not and what I had said was that the reason why we make mazoinus and sponge cake is because it's pasa boba kisnin because it's made with fruit juice with eggs, with, with oranges, whatever. That status of Pasa Baba Kisnin, because it's made with fruit juice, is not unanimous. And therefore, according to some, it's Hamoitzi. So although on sponge cake we do make mazoinus, but in the middle of a meal, you would not make a bracha on a sponge cake. That's what I said. So a couple of people who listen to the shear or recordings said to me, wait a minute, there is another reason why sponge cake is mazoinus, and that's because it's made with a runny dough, or a, a um, it's not a dough which is kneaded, and kneaded as with a K-N-E-A-D. So in the Alter Rebbe Siddha, he talks about what are the kinds of breads which are not normally used for a meal, and therefore mazoinus. He gives three titles, Lachmanios, in the past of Baba Kistin, we've discussed at length. And what are Lachmanios and Troiknin? Let's, before we go further, the fact that in modern Hebrew, Lachmania means, I believe, a role, that's just not going to help you over here because we have to understand what Chazal meant when they used the word Lachmania, not what Ben Yehuda uh, adopted it for. Okay, so lachmanios heim minei lochomim dakim verakim. It's thin, thin loaves, and they're made with a blila racho. They're made with a thin mixture, not a thick mixture, like a dough of bread which is kneaded and rolled with your hands. It's more like isa sufkinin. It's more like a spongy uh, dough which you can't really roll with your hands, and then it's baked. Okay. So this is where they're coming from, that we have here Lachmanias and also Truknin. We talk about a runny dough. So is the reason, so all right, so let's 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 rephrase the question. If I made a a uh, a dough, just flour and water, no, no fruit juice. And it's 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 not a thick dough, it's a runny dough. And don't ask me the recipe, but if I took it and I put it into a baking tin and put it into the oven and it baked and it's now just flour and water, is it hamoitsi or mazoinus? It's now it's now two inches thick, like a like a, a sponge cake, but it doesn't have any it doesn't have any fruit juice. It's just flour and water. Is it hamoitsi or mazoinus? This is my question. So again. Does it qualify as Lachmanios? Because he defines it as Rdakim Varakim. And that's why I feel that you cannot rely on Lachmanios to say that sponge cake is Lachmanios, because I don't think sponge cake is, def is defined as Dakim Varakim. But let's be a little bit clearer. Here, that's in the Alter Rebbe Siddur. Now we're looking at Alter Rebbe Talk about He uh, talks about Lachmanios and he uses these words, Nivlish, which is the old French. It uh, doesn't help me very much. And then we have Medinas Elo Belinus again. I could tell you Blinces, but I don't know whether he means Blinces. I don't know. 
He talks about it's made with a runny mixture, and you pour it out like a crepe kind of thing. Then, but let's read further. We'll have to negate to us. A filo oisum sheim lasen kol sheim li losen ofe ein alein toyas lechem b'shas lishon v'loy b'shas afio af im nit genu b'mashke. If it's something which is a soft mixture and it's fried in oil, then it's mizoynus. This is what's important to us. This runny mixture was baked in an oven or in a pan without liquid, as in oil. It is a totally absolute bread. Even if you didn't have a large amount, and we know they talk about Dalad Bayim, etc., just he's saying if it's baked in an oven, this this runny stuff, but it's baked in an oven without adding. So he says it becomes this. Uh, if as long as, even though this a so he seems to be saying that it qualifies as hamotzi. Since it's not so thin, so not so runny. It's not a thick dough, and it's not a kneadable dough, but it's not mamish like a crepe. And therefore, he says, if it's baked in an oven, it does become hamoitzi. Therefore, I'm coming back. What is the what is the mozona status of a sponge cake? Is it because of the runny uh, texture? I see that that doesn't help us because it's baked into in an oven. It's not mamish rakomoid, and therefore I think it would you'd only be able to rely on it being mazoinous because of the liquid content, the sugar and the and the oil and the orange juice, and therefore it doesn't help for in, during a meal. You you should not be making a uh, mazoinous on it. Okay, um, let's go on. What else do we have here for today? Right. So some two more two more points, if you don't mind. One was we had the discussion about. Avocados again, uh, but <laughs> I'm not going to talk about avocados. It's just when they're talking about the unripe avocados which ripen on Shabbos, I use that as a launching pad to discuss the difference in muksa of something which was muksa um, by default or because you made it muksa. The grapes which you put up on the roof to dry out and it became mushy, that's called nira venidre, and if it becomes unmushy on Shabbos, it remains muksa for the rest of, rest of Shabbos. Whereas if it was a muksa which was beyond your control, so there that's called dochime koro, like uh, you have a, an animal which died on Shabbos, so it was muksa and the concept of Shabbos beyond your control. And then if it dies on Shabbos, you can cut up the the uh, corpse of the animal to feed the dogs. Story of, of Shleim Hamelach and Gemara Shabbos. So someone asked me the question: What about yogurt? There's a way of making your own yogurt, and that is. Don't ask me more details, but you put milk in these cups and they put them on a kind of slight, uh, a warm, kind of warm uh, machine, a warmer, and you leave it there for 10 hours, 12 hours, and it becomes yogurt. So is if you put up this yogurt on Arab Shabbat with milk in the cups, and it became, it became yogurt on Shabbos, are you allowed to eat those yogurts on Shabbos? This is, the, this is his question. So in my uh, amaratus about yogurts, I'm, I understand that it doesn't become inedible. Even in the middle of the process, you could drink those yogurts. So there's no question of muksa. With the, the raisins, the, the grapes, in the process of becoming raisins, in between they become mushy and really unpleasant to eat. With the yogurts, if it hasn't become yogurt, it doesn't become inedible, and therefore the question really doesn't apply. It does not be no question of muks there altogether. What in whilst I was researching for this, I found something interesting that the Benish Chai writes that you could make yogurt on Shabbos. He says that you're permitted to do it. It doesn't see that as a problem of bone. Now I just have a couple of minutes left. I want to share with you something interesting, and that is that that was a pun. That someone I met someone on Friday whose speciality is Hilchos Ribis, and he told me a very a, a very relevant situation. Reuven wants to buy a house, 
And for whatever reason, Reuven cannot get a mortgage. Shimon, a relative of his, let's say, has no problem getting a mortgage. So Reuven asks Shimon to take out a mortgage of 300,000 pounds. And with this money, Reuven buys a house. Um, I, I understand it must be that the house officially is registered under Shimon's name, otherwise the mortgage wouldn't go through. But as far as between them, it's Reuven is the owner of the house. Now, if you take out a mortgage for 300,000 pounds, so then you take it out for 25 years, let's say, so it's going to cost you, I'm just throwing a figure, it's going to cost you 450,000 in total. So it's going to be 150,000 pounds on top, and that's interest. Who pays it? So Reuven is paying every month, he's paying the mortgage. Who is liable to the bank? Shimon. So Reuven, so Shimon took out a loan of 300,000. He gave it to Reuven as a loan. And now Shimon has incurred a liability over 25 years of 150,000 pounds. That's between him and the building society. Reuven is paying the bill. So Reuven has borrowed 300,000 from Shimon and is paying on behalf of Shimon, he's paying another 150,000 pounds. That is a serious problem of Ribis. The simple solution to this is that the house never becomes Reuven's until the mortgage is paid off. So in this way, that instead of Reuven saying it's my house and just you're paying, and, I'm, and you're just you know, the, the front man, and now paying, the, you know, I'll pay the mortgage, etc. Instead, it should actually be between them understood. I don't know how this understood should be, but it should be that the house actually remains Shimon's as it is legally on paper. And Reuven is paying monthly, he's not paying Shimon's mortgage, he's paying rent. The, the rent per, per, per month is whatever Shimon's cost to the built society. That's the rent is charging Reuven for the duration of the mortgage. Once the mortgage is paid off, in Beshor Toivim Tzlachas, then they'll be able to uh, rephrase their arrangement and uh, without you know, to, to transfer the ownership to Reuven without any loans, etc. One other point related to that is... Sorry, Dan, would you have to put that into writing? Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. The other, the other uh, um, situation is where, let's say, someone goes to the bank and is borrowing a thousand pounds. The bank wants to have a guarantor, so he brings a guarantor. So now let's take Levi and Yehuda. Levi goes to the bank and borrows a thousand pounds. Yehuda is the guarantor. What would happen? The guy who pays in installments, so the thousand pounds will grow to twelve hundred pounds. If you if Levi doesn't pay, so Yehuda is going to pay. Yehuda then will turn back to Levi and say, Levi, go, I spent twelve hundred pounds um, for your loan, but Levi only got a thousand pounds. So by being responsible for the loan plus the interest. So then, actually, Yehuda is getting to a problem of committing to a, a situation of interest. That is, and I said that's going to be a problem. And therefore, he can be an, and he can be an, an order. He can be a, a guarantor. Then the bank won't buy this, but I don't think so. But he can be a guarantor for the principal, but he cannot be a guarantor for the for the uh, incurred interest. Now, the fellow who I met, so I'm, going to, I'm going to shift the blame on him. There's a special um base her for ribis stuff so if people do have i'm mentioning this if you do have ribis stuff and it's this it's such a minefield and so there are people who have specialized in that field and i'd, uh, I'd refer you to, to check it out with them um if you are so fortunate to have these problems okay i wish you all good evening Good to work. Good to work. Yeah.